going to be talking tonight about the mass line, which is an organizational strategy, perspective, theory, um, emerging from, from Maoism. Uh, and I think many of us have likely encountered in the course of, of organizing and participating in movements. So um, I think that going through what the mass line is, what it looks like uh, in practice, what the basic ideas are, and then looking at a couple of kind of example organizations and how they uh, differently apply the mass line um, will be useful. Um, and then I'll end with some some of our disagreements and what we might seek to do differently in, a, in our organized work. So I'm gonna start with a section called Old guy tells a story about the old days, um, or if you prefer, example scenario. So <clears throat> um, in uh, 2011, I was an organizer with a socialist group um, in Florida. And it will probably not shock anyone to learn that at that time, there were some pretty uh, heinous ideas about labor being circulated in the Florida state government. Some bills coming down the pike that would uh, further weaken uh, workers' right to organize in an already right to work state. There was a bill being considered to decertify any public sector union that had uh, less than a majority of members. Um, and again, in a right to work state, that can be that can be a struggle. Um, and so, in this context of a kind of ramping up of of anti labor legislation or potential legislation. Uh, a coalition was formed in the town where I was, and the socialist organization that I was a member of was invited to participate. This is a great development. We didn't start the coalition, but it was called, and there was a meeting, and there were people from different unions, different left groups, including the student left and kind of the, the, the town left, um, all kind of coming together to discuss organizing against these proposals. Um, in the first meeting that we attended, it was proposed that this coalition should be named Fight Back Florida. We just kind of proposed from the floor, like, hey, this would be a cool idea. This would be a good idea for the name of this organization. Uh, one of the members of my organization raised the question, wait a minute, isn't there already a, a national coalition and different groups across the country called Fight Back Blank working on this issue? Are we part of that? Are we not? Um, this got shut down. And in the aftermath of this, members of my organization at the time started getting late night phone calls from people accusing them of trying to red bait the organizers of this of this group um that they were threatening his union job and all of these kind of things and it uh exacerbated and a a kind of to that point calmed down kind of faction fight between the two organizations um, so just mentioning that the proposal was being that was being put forward had the same name as another group was being perceived as an extreme act of red baiting. We wound up getting shut out of this coalition in practice. So what the fuck happened here? Well, what happened was we had stumbled into uh, an example of mass line organizing. Um, and so I'm going to go through some of what that looks like. Uh, and then we'll probably return to the question of, of what in the world happened at that meeting toward the end. Um, so the organization that we grievously offended is a group called the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. Uh, my understanding is they might be familiar to some of y'all in Denver. Um, so this is a group that has its roots in the new communist movement in the 1970s, um, around the new left, kind of the Maoist, one of the Maoist wings of the new left, uh, now considers itself Marxist-Leninist, um, which if you're not up on your decoding left phraseology, this means that they're Stalinists. Right, this is a group that supports what they call actually existing socialism in Cuba, North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, China. Um, excuse me. They consider these countries to be examples of socialism. Um, they need to be defended. They also in, uh, will lend fairly uncritical support to any country that they consider an anti-imperialist country, um, including uh, Assad's government in Syria and the government of Iran, for example. Um, this group, at the same time, does support Democrats um, against what they would consider the worst enemies on the ballot. Um, they have a position paper from 2022. Um, the, 
making this case that the revolutionary strategy is to vote for for Democrats against particularly bad Republicans. Um, they're also the result of a split in 1991, which you might recognize as the year the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, one side of this split started reevaluating Stalinism and their support for the USSR and for China. Um, the other group doubled down, and that's who we're dealing with here. Um, so I want to take a look at what Freedom Road actually says about the mass line in their kind of public facing um, documents. This is these these points, uh, some points in the mass line is like an, uh, it's a position paper kind of, but it's also a um, sort of a study guide. So I want to start off with one particular example, uh, one of their study questions after a section on people learn through struggle. Is, do comrades agree with this? Clearly, many who consider, them, consider themselves leftists do not. For example, the main form of political, act, political activity of the Socialist Workers' Party and many of the sects that adhere to the ideas of Trotsky is selling newspapers. In the same vein, there are a number of organizations that say if only we repeat our good ideas long enough and loud enough, people will follow. So already a little bit of hostility towards uh, just the idea of putting forward one's ideas. So in their section, uh, Methods of Work and Leadership, uh, Freedom Road argues that building the struggle is at the core of our agenda and outline some key methods of work. And the first, their starting point is uh, to be the felt needs and wants of the masses of people, right? So to build struggle, we have to have a handle on what these felt needs are and what people are likely to do um, in order to achieve them. It doesn't really matter what ideas people have, their words. Um, we need to start with where people are at. So getting involved in, in struggle and finding out what people feel and want and need. Um, the next point is from the masses to the masses. We'll come back to this, this quote by Mao in a minute. Um, but having gotten in the struggle and determined what people feel and want, we use Marxism to sum up where people are at. Um, basing ourselves on what people are concerned about and what folks actually want, we develop slogans, policies, plans, ways to fight back that people will take up as their own. Uh, the revolutionary theory becomes material force only when people are acting on it. And this is the only way to test whether the theory, analyses, plans, et cetera, are correct. Um, so taking what I'm going to use their terminology, the masses want and feel. We sum that up using Marxism and bring it back with slogans, policies, and plans. And if that doesn't work, right, then the theory wasn't correctly summing up what people want. Um, they're drawing here on the, the, the second reading, I think we sent out, um, some questions concerning methods of leadership written by Mao, um, in which he puts forward a phrase that comes up all the time when talking about the mass line, which is all correct leadership is necessarily from the masses to the masses, right? So we take the ideas of the masses and concentrate them, turn them into slogans, ideas, plans, then go back to the masses and propagate and explain these ideas, that is their own kind of concentrated ideas, till the masses embrace them and test their correctness in action. Um, and then you do that again and again and again. Um, and this is, according to Mao, the Marxist theory of knowledge. Not going to read all this, um, but it is it is point point five in, in Mao's document, um, where oh, I wish I would highlighted the thing. Um, where he's reemphasizing this 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 necessity of summing up the experience of the masses, right? Um, and and using that to to correct defects in the revolutionary leadership to check up on work um, and so forth. <clears throat> so we're taking the ideas of the masses, concentrating them, going to the masses, putting them forward, getting them, they're being embraced. If you're doing good leadership, formulating general ideas out of the particular guidance, guidance meaning the politics of revolutionaries in this case, right? And then putting to them to the test of practice. Um, better leadership, he argues, comes with greater skill in doing this. So there's this movement into the masses and then back into the revolutionary group and then back into the masses having consolidated and concretized what the masses want. Um, so this makes sense on its own terms, right? But there are 
Um, well, well, we'll get to the problems. So just to, to kind of sum up the mass line in practice as Frizzo practices it at Freedom Road, the masses express who they are, the party summarizes, returns with slogans and guidance. Um, at no point in this process is it necessary for revolutionaries to identify themselves as revolutionaries, right? You don't have to tell the people in a movement you're working on that you are a Maoist. Um, you need to engage with the people who are around you, then go back to your group, come up with calls to action and so forth, slogans, then you can come back to the masses and introduce your new guidance, right? Um, for Freedom Road, this takes the form of front groups. Um, oftentimes camp, a campaign organization, for example, that labor coalition that, uh, that existed in Florida was really a Freedom Road socialist organization project. Likewise, around that time, circa 2009-10, uh, Freedom Road started taking over on a national scale, uh, Students for a Democratic Society branches, which was a student group named after the group from the 70s, um, but this one was, was founded in 06 in response to the Iraq War. Um, so this idea of from the masses to the masses, repeated intervention by revolutionaries, often in the form of these front groups, advancing the struggle by pushing mass ideas forward, right? Um, so you can kind of see already where, why they were so mad that we pointed out there was another organization with this name. Also, it's their newspaper has this name. I don't think we were breaking any news. Um, but they don't want to be outed as separate from the masses. They do not want it to be clear that they are actually an organized force um, in social and labor movements. So you get these front groups, you get these campaign organizations being taken over, SDS, et cetera. I'm sure there are more. Um, they're not the only group that does this. It's not only Stalinism and Maoism that uses front groups, but in this case, you're right, that's what we're talking about. So that's Freedom Road. I want to take a look at another Maoist organization, one that uh, no longer exists, called the Red Guards, or CRCP USA, which, if I'm not mistaken, stands for the Committee to Reconstitute the Communist Party of the United States of America. Um, so this group is what they would describe as, or they, this group was, what they would describe as Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, um, as opposed to Freedom Road, which the Red Guards would characterize as Marxist, Leninist, Mao Zedong thought. <clears throat> so the difference here is that the Red Guards see Maoism as kind of the highest form of Marxist politics, right? There's Marxism and then Leninism, as they understand it, and then Maoism is, is kind of the modern day peak of, of Marx's thought. This is an idea that's codified and that they draw from uh, a man whose nom de guerre was Chairman Gonzalo, who was the leader of the Communist Party of Peru, Shining Path. Um, and they they have a whole they have a whole justification for this. But the 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 key thing here is that they're really leaning into Maoism, right? Um, particularly Cultural Revolution era Maoism. Um, this group rejects actually existing socialism. So unlike Freedom Road, they don't consider any country in the world socialist. Um, they consider Russia to have ceased being socialist in 1956 with Khrushchev's secret speech in the beginning of de-Stalinization. Uh, they consider China to have ceased being socialist in 1976 um, with Chairman Mao's death and the rise of, of Deng Xiaoping to power. Uh, so you can see, you know, kind of where they're coming from. Uh, they're extremely into the great, what they call the great proletarian cultural revolution, um, usually just called the cultural revolution. Um, so the some of the ideas from that period, um, especially the idea that socialism is a stage, a distinct economic stage that is building towards communism. And in that process, it is necessary to what Mao said, what Mao termed uh, bombard the headquarters, which is to constantly revolutionize the socialist state to purge capitalist restorationist elements, what they would call capitalist rotors. Um, not going to get into the whole history of the Cultural Revolution, um, but the, what this group is taking from it partially is that. Um, they're also very invested in the idea of a protracted people's war, which is another concept from Mao, um, which is where revolutionaries set up base locations in the countryside not necessarily literally the countryside for the Red Guards, um, but set up bases of and build power kind of locally in that way with the ultimate goal of building toward armed insurrection, right? They see um, a long guerrilla war building up the confidence of the masses to engage in armed struggle as the path towards socialism. They do not anywhere in the 
40 page position paper that I'm going to be drawing on here uh, ever mention uh, labor struggles. They don't mention strikes or the general strike or dual governance or any of the things that we would draw on as features of the revolution we're trying to build towards. They're they're looking at this protracted people's war um, as as ultimately the, the way forward. Um, they have a, a, an idea around sending students to the countryside, which once again, this is now they're not necessarily referring to the literal countryside. But the idea here is to take people with what they would consider bourgeois ideas and send them to live among the people they're trying to organize, right? Um, this also, if you followed any of their Facebook presences back when they had one, they would also use this phrase to refer to going to like cadre training schools and retreats and um, even in some cases, just like collective living arrangements. Um, so for an organization like the Red Guards, whose whole deal or whose whole vision of what revolution looks like is a secret group arming the masses and waging armed war against the police and the state. How does the mass line work for them? Unsurprisingly, it takes the form of front groups. In the form of the Red Guards, they had um, several organizations across the country that were called Serve the People. They call them STPs, um, not the Stone Temple Pilots. This is Serve the People organizations, STPs. Um, and this is the way that front groups worked for the Red Guards. Um, so these, these are some just some excerpts from a position paper called Condemned to Win by the group I would note no longer exists, the Red Guards. Um, the Revolutionary Collective should be composed only of ideological advan ideologically advanced and principled Maoists who have subjugated all their personal interests to the collective without exception. So this is a, a extremely dedicated um, and committed kind of cadre core, right? Communist cadres should be engaged in both, both mass work and cadre work and should understand how one relates to the other dialectically. The role of the cadres is to provide guidance to the people through the mass organizations and the STPs. So you have this hardened core of extremely committed cadre influencing people through the mass organizations and the STPs. Um, so what do those mass organizations look like? They argue that mass membership must be open, meetings should be public with established points of unity, um, seeking to unite the broadest sections of the people um, in participation in STP, uh, and that they should in fact be run differently, right? We have higher expectations of, or they have higher expectations of cadre than of, of your average person involved in a serve the people group. Um, they criticize an orientation that says, follow us, we have the answers at the same time, right? Um, let's see. So how should, how should the Maoist cadre interact with people through these mass organizations? Well, we should do our best to make the community comfortable with how we appear to them. We should appear open and, and inviting. This often means submitting our own personal modes of expression to better integrate. This sometimes means looking like the workers of a given community without mocking your costume. To do this, cadre should seek full integration, socialize where the masses do, listen to the types of music the masses do, and always be accepting of the local customs and culture, seeking to handle inevitable contradictions that arise. Um, they can say this isn't costume, this feels like costume to me, right? They're like going undercover in communities in addition to being sort of uh, secretly cadre in these broader organizations. Um, so while the STPs in their conception should be broad, broader membership than the cadre organization, nonetheless, at no point in time should they fall into the hands of such individuals as have not been corrected and changed. Um, we must take measures not to be overrun by so many liberals that they can no longer be checked, balanced, and corrected. So we want STPs to be broad, we want broad participation, but we're gonna make sure that uh, the wrong people don't wind up exercising influence, right? So that this perspective, you can kind of see um, once again, um, the, the broad and open membership democracy of their front groups is, is in fact itself a frontier um, in their own words. Um, so, okay, before I go through this slide, uh, I want to make a note about the fact that I'm gonna use the word cult. Um, I think we should be extremely careful as leftists anytime we say something is a cult. Um, capitalism will call anything from like a punk house to just being trans a cult. Um, and liberals will call any organization that actually makes demands on its members time 
cult-like. Um, so I just want to be clear that I'm being extremely specific and deliberate when I say that the Red Guards fell apart due to abusive cult practices, um, entrenched sexism, intimate partner violence. It's uh, you can find documentation from former members online, and it's 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 uh, bad. Um, I also want to be clear that I'm not accusing the previous organization I was discussing of these practices, right? Um, and while it is true that no no political tendency is like immune from this happening, Trotskyism isn't, um, no matter how much we might like it to be. Um, in this case, what facilitated and developed this was the political emphasis that the Red Guards took on transforming individual people into revolutionaries. The, like criticism and self-criticism sessions, which is like the Maoist precursor to privilege checking, essentially. Um, you can find documentation of the way that they ran collective housing where multiple members lived. It was run kind of in a military way. Um, it was an extremely kind of regimented idea of collective housing. And also the what we've sort of already seen a little bit, these voluntarist demands of cadre, meaning it's not a matter of like participating in struggle that transforms you. We're going to like crack down and force ourselves to transform into new kinds of like ideal uh, Maoist representatives. Um, the Red Guards would also had a, had a, a, a fondness for showing up to protest in armed masked contingents. If, you're, if you've ever seen pictures, especially from Austin, of people in red hammer and sickle bandanas holding um, Kalashnikovs, that was these guys. Um, they also physically attacked and broke up a DSA meeting uh, near me in Kansas City in 2019 with like bats and boards and stuff. So um, those are some other things I were up to. So what is the mass line in practice for the Red Guards? Extremely secretive clandestine cells of committed cadre. Um, they repeatedly emphasize that their ideal for idea ideal size is like three to six people for a for a, a branch or a cell. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, often living together uh, and operating through broad serve the people front groups, which which combined aid work and political education. A lot of what they did um, was uh, providing like food. They would also um, try to find ways to confront who they, they consider gentrifiers in the Boyle Heights neighborhood of Los Angeles. Um, so it's kind of like aid work combined with political education, trying to draw new people in gradually. Uh, the cadre retained control over the front groups, um, even though most participants in these front groups may not have even known that the Red Guards as an organization existed. Um, and as I said, no attention was paid whatsoever to the labor movement. They aimed to build base locations in the countryside in preparation for um, the protracted people's war, as it were. So, from fairly different political orientations, and they're both, broadly speaking, Maoist, but Freedom Road and the Red Guards had very different um, ideas about what that would mean, right? Um, you would never see somebody in Freedom Road talking about a protracted people's war, and you would never see somebody in the Red Guards talking about strategically voting for Democrats, right, or unions. Um, but they come to, to have certain similarities in how they exercise the strategy of the mass line. Um, and one of the things that I would argue the mass line does is it refuses to engage with the actual politics of workers um, in the name of meeting them where they are. Um, the Red Guards repeatedly instruct their membership not to argue with, like, oh, don't, don't argue with, um, you know, a member of the masses if they use, like, re reactionary language, right? We want to meet them where they are. Um, and this conception of movement work, well, also involves at the same time aiming to guide the masses to correct politics without fully revealing their own. Um, so there's kind of two parts there, right? Meeting them where they are and then kind of guiding them somewhere else um, by, you know, from the masses to the masses, right? Um, and also to maintain what they would consider security culture, it's necessary to respond to any direct political debate as red baiting. Um, and this is what, what I would argue happened in that meeting in Florida, right? Is that they're trying to go to the masses, from the masses to the masses. And then here we are in this meeting saying, wait a minute, what are the politics of these other groups that we're now starting to get affiliated with, right? Um, that was kind of threatening to their process of uh, covertly radicalizing the struggle, I suppose. Um, so what should we do? We don't want to do the mass line. What do we want to do? Well, we aim to win the working class to Marxist politics through openly debating strategy, tactics, and politics. And you can't do this as a secret socialist, 
right? You can't sneak into the movement and win somebody to Marxism. It just, it, it cannot be done. Um, and I think it's important for us to understand that participants in social movements, unions and rebellions all have their own politics. So um, I was trying to come up with some diagrams and failed to do it, um, but maybe I can describe them. You can imagine the mass lines conception of the masses, right? You have the masses. And then the party comes into the masses, sees what's going on, comes out of the masses, formulates slogans, and then back into the masses, right? I think we should conceptualize our work differently, right? We are a tendency in working class movements, right? So it's not us going into the masses and then coming out. There's us, there's other political groups, there's other social movement groups, there are NGOs, there are individuals, and all of these different uh, components of movements need to be openly debating and discussing and trying to win people to their positions, right? There isn't a the masses that we're um, trying to, to inject ourselves into and move forward. Um, so I would argue not from the masses to the masses, but as organized workers in the strong is how we should think of ourselves. Um, and there's a broader political reason for this as well, rather than just being practical, right? What we're talking about when we talk about revolution isn't a protracted people's war or a guerrilla war waged by, um, you know, some, some radicals who have established a social base in the countryside. What we're talking about when we talk about revolution is the self-emancipation of the working class, right? We say this all the time, but it's really important, right? We don't want to just nudge the masses towards revolution. We actually want to train the working class and ourselves how to emancipate ourselves through political struggle. Um, this requires that the working class learns to exercise their power collectively, democratically making decisions, collectively building organizations and events and so forth. And this includes us. It's not just the work of the class that has to learn how to do this. We have to learn how to do this as we continue to grow and deal with, with problems and situations um, that we haven't encountered before. 